Let's open our Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, and hold your finger there and then turn to Luke chapter 9. We'll be reading from them two sections tonight and, and then some more that we'll have on the screen, but them two you'll read in your Bibles with me. And uh, We're continuing the study that we started last week. This is the second part of a two-part series uh, on the character of a servant, the character of a servant life. And Jesus displayed these characteristics of a servant's life. And not only did He display them, He showed them as in an example. He lived them out. He taught them and He lived them and He called His disciples. And that applies to us. We are now His disciples. He has called us to walk in a servant life. The characteristics that we examined last week was seven, and then we've got seven that we will examine tonight, but let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask that you open our hearts, Father, that we see how you displayed your love and your grace, Father, in the way that you walked among mankind, and Father, that you will teach us to do the same, Lord, even through your word tonight, in Jesus' name. So the characteristics that we examined last week, we'll kind of touch over them just to refresh ourselves of them. First was a servant. Just as the title says, a servant life, so first would naturally be a servant. You see, we are called to serve others. And Jesus, again, demonstrated this. The second was to not lord it over. He spoke of how the Gentiles like to lord over the others. And He told the disciples, don't be the same way. To not lord it over. We should serve others in unity and in peace and in a togetherness rather than trying to lord over. The third was as an example. And again, Jesus even said that He was setting an example as He washed the disciples' feet. And then He told them, do likewise. So we, as Christians, as believers, as living a servant life, we too should wash feet in the sense that we take care of others' needs. We should look and see how we can provide and how we can help others. The fourth example was humble. We should never look at ourselves higher than we ought to. And Jesus demonstrated this. Jesus was one, He was God. He could have certainly looked at Himself highly, but He humbled Himself and become a servant. And then the fifth was as a child. Our dependence should always be on the Lord, just as a child is dependent upon a parent or someone taking care of them. That is the same type of dependency that we should display for our Lord. Now, not only as a child, but the sixth characteristic was as the younger. So, as the young child, we know that throughout the Bible, Old Testament spoke of the oldest son getting the birthright. They were the ones that was privileged and that should have had what was the best part of the inheritance. But we see time and time again throughout the Old Testament, God flipping it upside down and the younger becoming the one who received the birthright and the inheritance and so forth. And we should be as the younger. Again, knowing that it's not of our doing. It's not that we deserve anything, but because God is working in our lives. And the last one that we looked at last week was as the last. That means that we prefer others before ourselves. We don't always have to be the first in the line. Let others go before us. That is part of being a servant. Now, as we come to this week's study, the part two of this series, we're going to look at the final seven characteristics of a servant life. And these characteristics, again, they shine forth in the life of Jesus. Now, obviously, these aren't the only 14. We could go and just read through the Gospels and see many characteristics of our Lord. And say, here's another one, and here's another one. But these 14 were pulled from somewhat from the greatest in the kingdom of God teachings that Jesus had done. See, often the disciples wondered, hey, who's going to be the greatest? Is it me, uh, John, or is it you, Peter? Who's it going to be? And Jesus again and again told them what it take, what it would take to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And of course, again, point to Jesus because we know that He is the greatest in the kingdom of God. He was the ultimate service uh, servant in what He did. But again, as we follow His example, we should do likewise. We should live a servant life. So here we're starting it with part two. And the first one 
in this section here. And what we're going to do is just jump to number eight, since this is actually the eighth characteristic. And it comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it's to be the least. Luke 9, chapter, uh, sorry, verse 46 through 48 is what we'll read. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. As we said, right, these disciples was often doing this. Who's going to be the greatest of us? And Jesus perceived the thought of their hearts. He even knew that deep inside this is what they thought. And so he took a child and he set him by him and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So here we see the word least. We certainly see the upside down approach to the kingdom of God. Again, just like in the Old Testament, God would take and the younger would all of a sudden receive the inheritance. And David become king and he had all these other brothers. And the different stories that we see, the same thing Jesus is showing takes place. An upside down approach to the kingdom of God. Now it's hard for us to understand that. I would say with our natural minds, it's quite impossible for us to understand it. Because it's a spiritual thing. We have to understand the word of God in the spirit. We have to be spirit led and and spirit driven to be able to understand and receive God's word. And certainly to walk in them. See, our whole life though, we've uh, likely been taught that we must do everything that we can do to get on top. We must be the first, not the last. We should be above, not beneath. We should be the most and not the least, right? That's what we've been taught probably our whole life. And in the world, uh, in a secular sense, you were probably taught that, but now you pivoted over to Christianity and you may have received the same message. I know the church that I went to for years, this would have been the same message. It would have been what we might call the prosperity gospel because it teaches this very same thing. It takes a scripture from Deuteronomy that does say that they're to be the first and not the last and above and not uh, beneath, but it twists it. You see, just because the scripture says that, we must understand it in context. It does not mean that your pocket should be fuller than the brother down the road. That is not what it means, and that's what the prosperity gospel has caused it to mean, or have taken it to mean. But we can clearly see that's not what Jesus taught. He taught rather than being the most, rather than being the one on the top, to be the least, to serve others, to live a servant life. Being the head in the kingdom of God means that we get down at the feet. We wash others' feet. Being above means that we bow below in order to take care of others' needs. And being the greatest or the most means that we must be least. And that's what Jesus taught. He flipped the whole mindset upside down for Christianity. For the Christian living, this is what we should be doing. John 3, John the uh, Baptist, he makes this statement. He says, speaking of Jesus and himself, he said, He, Jesus, must increase but I must decrease. And this is the continual process that should take place in the believer's life. We should become less as God becomes more in us. That's what God wants to do. He wants to change us. He wants to make us the head, not the tail. But in His will, in His plan, in God's will for our lives. Now in us becoming the least, in the Lord becoming more in our lives, we'll find our ninth characteristic in this, in, in Matthew 12, so hopefully you've already turned there, Matthew 12, and we'll look at verse 18 through 21, and this is going to be dealing with how Jesus took care of business. Jesus didn't go in forcing things to happen. He actually used the use of no force. So here we read it, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved. And this is describing Jesus here as we read. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax 
shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. See, again, Jesus took care of business in a different way than we might think business should be taken care of. Jesus did not have to force things. He did not have to strive and try to make things happen. He didn't have to go around begging for people to follow Him. He did not have to holler and shout. Jesus had to be no loud mouth. Jesus could simply speak the words and the demons would leave. He didn't have to call it at a certain volume or tempo. Jesus just simply spoke God's Word, His Word. Because that's God's Word, isn't it? But notice the nature of those that received His words. That those who received His love. We read that a bruised reed he shall not break. Basically, those who, if you've ever seen a bruised reed or a reed on the side of a shore where it's done bent over, the idea here is that God doesn't just whack it out. He doesn't take his weed eater to it. God will stand it back up and, and support it in order for it to receive the water again and begin growing to its full potential. In a sense, he takes the load off. And a smoking flax, he will not quench. See, is there still a little spark left? Even if there's just a little spark in our lives, we may feel like it's almost all put out, but if there's still a little spark, God's not going to snuff it out. He's not going to put it out. He fans it with His loving grace until it becomes a fire again, until it becomes a flame to do His purpose. See, to walk like Jesus we must look for the opportunities to do the same thing for others. How can we create restoration in someone's life? You see, we should be all about restoration, not desolation. We should be about building people back up and not forcing things to happen. Remember, we don't have to force it. God is the one doing the work. We can simply speak His Word and just let Him work and enjoy it. We can sit back and watch and say, God, you did all that. Because it certainly wasn't because of what I had done. So restoration, not desolation. And we come to our tenth characteristic. You see, the servant life should uh, realize what it's called to do and to serve. And there should be no blind ambition. A blind ambition would be basically you saying, well, I think it ought to be done this way. And you just go forward with it without really worrying about the consequences and so forth. Now, again, we're going to look at Jesus as our example. But now we're going to be going to the book of Philippians. And you don't have to turn there. I've got this one on the screen. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. We read, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See, Jesus knew exactly who He was. There was no beating around the bush. He didn't have to guess and wonder who He was. He knew that He was the only begotten of the Father, the Son that was sent. He knew that He was and He still is God. And that was, again, John uh, John the Baptist paints this picture often that Jesus is God. Yet He did not take it as an opportunity to benefit or profit from the fame. He could have. Remember, there was opportunity. Think of the money that Jesus could have made when breaking the bread and, and the fish and He's giving it out. Now, this could have been a huge start to the bread and fish cafe. I mean, we could have put one on every hill there in Jerusalem, right? And made the money had Jesus wanted to make profit off of it. But He did not do that. It was no blind ambition. His focus was on what God wanted him to do. Think about the healing ministry, the Two Eyes Seeing Center. It could have been set up. There's plenty of people that needed the healing of the Lord. The motto for the Two Eyes Seeing Center would have certainly been two eyes are better than one. Jesus was tempted to do just this. Satan tempted Jesus, hey, make your kingdom now. Your kingdom can be right now. And he will do the same to us. Let's build a kingdom in order for us to look great. But that's not God's plan for us. You see, all eyes should be focused on Jesus. When Jesus was tempted by Satan to start this earthly kingdom, He rejected the idea. Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. And we should remember ours is not of this world either. For those walking a spirit life or a servant life, a servant life, walking in the spirit, certainly, we should keep our focus on the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is certainly now. And we're walking in that as we do God's will. 
But it's certainly something to come to. It's a future hope that we look forward to as well. So rather than ambitiously seeking to build our own kingdom, the focus should be on the Lord. Now continuing with this passage here in Philippians, we come to our 11th characteristic and it ties to that previous trait of the no blind ambition. You see, because if we are ambitious according to our own desires, that blind ambition, then we tend to want to make ourselves of a great reputation. Again, let's build our kingdom now. Let's put our name out there so that we look like we have really done something. But this 11th characteristic of a servant life is no reputation. And this continues right here in Philippians where we're at in chapter 2. See, verse 7 tells us, but he, but, but Jesus, it says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So if we are filled with ambition, a good ambition, there's nothing wrong with that. We should be ambitious about the things of God. We just need to know that it's according to God's will and according to His Word, that it's not blind ambition. See, the fact is, is if it motivates us to make a name for ourselves, if it motivates us to, to build ourselves up rather than serving others or rather than serving Christ, it's certainly blind ambition and it's not of the Lord. The servant life seeks to glorify the name of Jesus and not our name. Now as we come to the final three characteristics also found in this chapter in Philippians, the twelfth is that our Lord became human. See, Jesus stepped down to this earth in the form of man. Philippians 2.8 tells us, And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See, God again, He stepped into this world as mankind, being born of a virgin, being placed in an old feeding trough. Now think, He could have chosen different. God could have certainly chosen, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to give him to that king there in order for them to put lights up on the wall and say, Jesus has come. My son is here. I've got the Messiah that was born to me. But He chose not to do it that way. He sent Jesus in a humble, very humble beginning. God stepped in the world in form of a man. And he knew. He knew what he had come to do. And we see that he humbled himself, as we read there in verse 8. He humbled himself. And as we walk in this world, now we didn't step down from God in that sense that Jesus did. We was born into this world. But he wants us to remember our humanity as well. See, sometimes I think as Christians, we can begin begin getting so high-minded that we forget where we come from. I've heard it said that some people are so heavenly-minded that they are no earthly good. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it take place where people have almost been a stumble, a stumbling stone for the kingdom of God rather than building up the kingdom of God because, oh, they thought they were something. They were God's next gift to mankind, it would seem. And they were sure to let you know that. And it causes damage in the kingdom of God. So we should remember that we are, as I think the song says it, only human. Right? We are only human. This doesn't mean that we're not called though and called for a purpose that's greater than our human ability. But we must trust the Lord in it. See, the next part of the servant life was that Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. And that's our next two points is obedience and death. You see, the thirteenth the thirteenth characteristic is that of obedience. And we see that obedience in Jesus' cry in the garden. Remember when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he said this saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. This gives us the idea that Jesus in His humanity, as spoken of here in Philippians, may have thought, I don't really want to do that. Do I really have to go to the cross? Again, Jesus was 100% human. He was 100% God, but He was 100% human. And we must remember that. And so here He says, 
hey, <laughs> remove this cup from me if it be thy will. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, Jesus was obedient. He was obedient even unto death. And many times what we've been called to do as servants, it may not be very easy. Oftentimes it's not very easy. It could even feel like we're going to die. Maybe God's called us to do something where, God, you don't know how that makes me feel. I may feel low. I may feel, as we've heard the uh, term, you eat, have to eat crow. You have to go back and apologize maybe for something that you've done. It could feel like death. It could feel as if we're going to die. But the servant life is called to be one of obedience. And we should say, just as Jesus said, not my will, not me maintaining my prideful way and saying I'm not going to apologize, but thy will be done. That should be our hearts. And then as we come to that 14th and final characteristic, and that's death. This probably would seem like the hardest one, right? The servant life that, that Jesus, our Lord, led. It was certainly one that took Him to death. He died on the cross for us. He gave His life. He gave the ultimate sacrifice in giving His life for mankind. John 10 verse 18 tells us, this is Jesus uh, speaking of His life. He says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. See, while living a life for Christ may not mean that we physically die. I have to physically die for Him. It could. There's been many of people that had to physically die for their stand for Jesus Christ. There are martyrs that have taken that stand. Will we have to be there? Maybe. Maybe not. Who knows, right? We don't know what tomorrow may bring as far as our stand for the Lord. But regardless of whether we have to die for Him or we're able to live till we're whatever age He wants us to live and we go on to glory in peace, we still must make a walk towards the cross. As servants and as living the servant life, we still must live a sacrificial life. See, Matthew 16, verse 24 tells us, Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. That means we must be willing to die. In this calling, this Christian calling, this servant life, we must remember what Jesus said in uh, John ten eighteen that we just read. Jesus said of His own life that He was able to lay it down. He was the one that laid it down. They didn't take it from Him, but He was able to take it up again. That speaks of the resurrection. You see, for the servant life to function, it has to function through the resurrection power that comes from Jesus. That is the only way that we can actually live a life that's, that where we're willing to serve others is through the power of of Christ to walk in all of these characteristics for that matter we can only do them through the through the blood through what Jesus Christ has done for us so to sum things up we're going to take a look just back over all 14 characteristics that the Lord Jesus showed in his own life and that he's provided the power for us to walk in our life through his resurrection again that's what gives us the power so the first seven was that we looked at last week was servant, not lorded over, example, humble, as a child, as the younger, as the last. And from tonight, seven, I'm going to kind of do like I did last week. If you remember, I asked a question on each of these in closing. So we'll kind of do it the same way. So number eight was least. Do we lift ourselves up? Or are we willing to decrease in order for Him to be increased in us? What do people see when they really see us? Are they seeing Jesus? Or do they see our arrogant ways? Whatever we may think that we are. The ninth one was no force. Do we look for opportunities of restoration or desolation? See, rather than trying to force things to happen, do we allow God just to work in us? Do we just speak His Word and say, God, I trust that You're going to do the work with Your Word. 
The tenth one was no blind ambition. Are our eyes open to God's desire and plan for our for our lives? For us as a church body, are our eyes open? Or do we tend to have our own agendas in motion? We have to be careful that we don't come up with our own plans. Now, God will give us visions. He certainly should give us visions. Every church, every body of believers should have a vision. We just have to make sure it's in line with His plan for us. Number 11 was no reputation. Do we live for His name? Or do we try to make our name something of of greatness? Number 12, human. We know that we're in this world. But as we've often heard, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. Right? We don't have to partake of everything that this world does. But we should certainly love them. And I said them, not it. We shouldn't love the sin that mankind carries on in. We shouldn't love the sin that myself carries on in. Right? Because we all have issues. But we should love the person. And we should know that God loves us even though we stumble and fall. God loves us. Wow, you know, I really, I, I want to say that again because I think God really wants us to hear that. No matter how we fall, what we've done yesterday, what, what we may do tomorrow, God loves us. He cares for us. Teenagers, He cares for each of us. The 13th one is obedience. Do we walk in obedience to the Lord? It's important that we do find His will for our lives and walk in that. And the only way we can know His will is by getting into His Word. Communicate with people that love the Lord and they can help you along in this. Are we walking in obedience? Again, as Jesus said, not my will. Hey, Jesus said this, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my human will, but God, your will. Because we know, again, Jesus is 100% God. So that will was done in His life. And then again, the 14th and final point for tonight. And, and this is never easy, right? But we must die to self. That may not mean a physical death for us ever. We hope that it don't. We hope that we will not have to be martyred for the Lord. But it still means that we're going to encounter things in our life where it can feel like death that we're going through in order to deal with other people. People can be hard to deal with. And it takes us laying our lives down in order to for that life to flourish. So we must die to self in order that we may live, actually. Are we carrying our cross? Again, our Lord Jesus, He showed these characteristics of a servant life. And He is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And He is the one that we're to serve. So that makes us His servants. And it means that we should serve others. And the ultimate way that we will be one with the Lord and one with others. You know, we speak and have been speaking lately of unity. For us to do that, we must come to grips with this servant life. Lord, we praise you. We thank you that you were a servant for us, God, and all that you've done, that you went all the way to the cross. But the cross, the, the grave, the death didn't hold you down, but you resurrected. And that gives us the power, Father, to, to be servants as well. So, Father, we ask that as we go from this place, Lord, that you stir our heart in such a way that we will want to find opportunities just to let other people know that we care for them. And most of all, that you care for them. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.